As I record this, our nation has been shut down for months. The world is reacting to the emergence of a new virus. You, or someone you know, may have been furloughed or laid off. You might have had your business closed, never to reopen again. Some within the sound of my voice are working in essential industries, worried about their health and the well-being of their families. For those that are staying at home and obeying the quarantine orders, many have taken the time to enrich themselves. Some are simply taking a well-deserved break. Within the realm of Freemasonry, many are passing the time by diving into Masonic texts for further light, for better or for worse. One of the most common complaints I hear from those attempting to learn from the old texts of our ancient craft is the often impenetrable nature of the prose. Most new members of our ancient and accepted Scottish rite receive a copy of Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma upon attaining the 32nd degree, but few actually read it cover to cover. If they've received the new annotated version, they'll read the introductory sections, but will quickly get overwhelmed in the depths of chapter 1. The problem with this scenario is one of technique, not one of intelligence. You have everything that you need to both comprehend the text and to find meaning within it, if you approach it as a foreign language text. Yes, the language of Albert Pike's time in Masonry is quite foreign to today's Masonic audience. As a teacher of English in secondary school, I want to introduce you to a simple device that I utilize in my courses to help culturally and linguistically diverse learners comprehend an academic text that's delivered in a new language. But first, I'd like to address your initial skepticism at my declaration of Freemasonry as a foreign language. For discussion, what do you think about the presenter's statement that the books that make up the foundation of Freemasonry for example, the works of Albert Pike and his contemporaries are written in a foreign language. Place the recording on pause. If you're watching this as part of a group, discuss the question. If you're engaging with this recording on your own, contemplate the question and be prepared to defend your position. Continuing on, I'll explain my premise. The language that we learn in the K-12 environment is oriented around basic interpersonal communication skills, or BICs. BICs proficiency does not prepare one for academic texts full of specialized low-frequency words. It takes about three years to develop BICs proficiency in any given language. It takes a minimum of five years to develop a specific cognitive academic language proficiency, or CALP. If you haven't learned the Masonic language, let's start down that path today. Back to the helpful device. When diving into a complex academic work, the device that English teachers often use is called It Says, I Say, and So. Here's how it works. Start small. Morals and Dogma, for example, is a complex work. Take it one paragraph at a time. Given the situation we find ourselves in today, Let's consider the paragraph from Chapter 6, Intimate Secretary. Masonry is the great peace society of the world. Wherever it exists, it struggles to prevent international difficulties and disputes, to bind republics, kingdoms, and empires together in one great band of peace and amity. It would not so often struggle in vain if Masons knew their power and valued their oaths. And now the it says portion. What is Pike saying? What is this about? What clues are within the text that can help with meaning and comprehension? Pause the recording. Consider these questions yourself or as a group. When you've come to a consensus, resume the recording. Continuing, we'll address the I say portion of the exercise. What do you know about the content already? This step is meant to activate your prior learning on the topic. Don't rush through this. You can make up a chart if it helps. You may want to explore each word separately. For example, given the classroom lecture on this degree and the guidance found in Bridge to Light, what is peace and peacemaking? Let's do it together, borrowing from Section 6.1 of the Revitalize program. 
Peacemaking is a complicated concept because peace can be defined in so many ways. For our purposes, Masonic academic language, peacemaking is not a process of passive acceptance of mistreatment, a turning of the other cheek in face of clear injustice or abuse, or the weak images of meekness or non-resistance. Think of the 30th degree. Instead, peacemaking, as used by Pike, is a vibrant and powerful concept. Peacemaking creates relational and structural justice that allows for social and personal well-being, something we can certainly use in times like these. Let's dive deeper. When I speak of peace, I understand the concept in two ways. First, there is negative peace. Negative peace means the absence of violence, typically through coercion other than cooperation. For example, when mother tells Joey to stop beating up on his little brother, she is imposing a negative peace on the household. Joey's conflict with his little brother is not resolved, but merely suppressed. The concept of negative peace extends not only from our mundane example in the home, but also to international relations. International peace is said to exist during a sensation of violence and hostility. This form of peace is often imposed by the United Nations peacekeepers, or outside nation-states. Again, peace is defined as an absence of war and is imposed coercively. Our own law enforcement mechanisms, euphemistically called criminal justice, create another form of negative peace. The bad guys are taken off the streets so that, in theory, crimes are reduced. Thus, law enforcement officials are called peace officers, even though they use extremely coercive and sometimes violent means to achieve their ends. Finally, the legal system perpetuates a form of negative peace. At best, the civil justice system renders a fair and impartial decision. However, the result is just a decision, not a resolution or a transformation of the conflict. Thus, judgment, the legal conflict is finished, and people are expected to get on with their lives. Generally speaking, however, the underlying causes of the conflict are left unresolved. How satisfied are a father and daughter after judgment in favor of one or the other in a bitterly contested trial. So the legal system does not provide for peace. It only provides for decisions. The second way of understanding peace is as positive peace. Positive peace implies reconciliation and restoration through creative transformation of conflict. In positive peace, mother sits the brothers down and invites them to exchange stories about what led to their fight. Mother and the boys learn, for the first time, that Joey feels angry at the way his brother ignores him. In five minutes, they work out a plan that allows Joey the safety and security to speak out about what he is feeling. Joey's brother, Johnny, promises to listen more carefully to Joey. Joey promises not to hit Johnny when he becomes frustrated. The fighting has stopped, but more importantly, the relationship has been reconciled and restored. The process, Johnny and Joey have grown morally, if not just a little. In the same way, a lawyer as peacemaker looks at conflict not just as an abstract intellectual exercise in the analysis and in persuasion, but as an opportunity to help people reconcile. When reconciliation is not possible, separation and resolution is possible with a minimum of hostility and acrimony. In this sense, Peacemaking seeks long-term, sustainable solutions rather than polite agreements or uneasy and fragile truces to difficult conflicts. In peacemaking, truth-telling and truth-seeking are honored, integrity is valued, and trust is given because it is earned. Peacemaking offers an opportunity to explore and discover that which is as yet unimagined. Peacemaking techniques are creative, exploratory, and filled with risk, fear, and excitement of discovery. Peacemaking is a refuge, a safe haven from the incivility and outright nastiness of conflict. Peacemaking requires tremendous courage by those faced with difficult conflict. And so, peacemaking concerns a deeper way of looking at conflicts than just winning or losing. It looks at conflicts as opportunities for people to grow, to accept responsibility for the relationships they are in, and for the potential of apology and forgiveness. Here in Chapter 6, Pike uses the concept of peacemaking 
to describe the values and processes involved in the transforming difficult and intractable conflicts. With the new details about peacemaking in mind, can you see now why Pike describes Freemasonry as the great peace society of the world? If you take your time and examine the text in this way, you will be able to discern the amazingly deep insights found therein and integrate them into your daily lives. Now, you try it with the next segment of that passage. Consider what is being said, put it into your own words, and with the remainder of your time, discuss the significance.